Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Deborah. How Hi, Coco. Doing? Hi. <laughs> so happy you could make it to today's Tuesday Talks. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank, you for thank you for asking me to come here. Today. Yeah. So Professor Deborah Christie, you are a clinical psychologist and a professor of pediatric and adolescent psychology at UCL. You are an internationally recognized expert um, for the care of young people with chronic illnesses. And you're also a co-editor-in-chief of Clinical Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Mm. So those are some big words, adolescence and psychology. And these are the things that we'll be talking about today. So I'm very excited to talk about that. Um, to start off, maybe tell us about your interest in the subject and how you became a specialist in adolescence. Okay, well, it's quite a it's it's a long story, but I'll do the short version okay. for you, Coco. <laughs> so I always wanted to be a psychologist. I was always interested in behaviour, but particularly in children. Why children behave in particular ways, and I was interested in children with learning disabilities. So right from thirteen, I wanted to be a psychologist, and I kind of continued that path. So I did my psychology, and I did my PhD in neuroscience, which was really about the brain, so understanding how the brain worked. Um, and then I started working with children who had cancer and um, understanding what impact the treatment of cancer had had on them and their functioning. And then I went to UCLH and it was to set up a unit for adolescents. Now, adolescent health as a specialism is very big in America, very big in Australia. But 25 years ago, there was nowhere in the UK that was focusing on adolescence. And the difference, the main difference was that rather than thinking of a child as an illness, we thought of adolescence as the primary diagnosis. Okay. Kids had a space to come because they were an adolescent. Okay. They were in that age group. And they also happened to have an illness or a condition. Um, and I just, I just loved it. I was fascinated by it, incredibly challenging at times, but it was also really exciting. And uh, that was it, really. I was hooked. And so that's what I've spent the last... 25 years doing, 26 years doing. It's horrible when you add it all up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on from that. <laughs> yeah, adolescence is such an interesting topic, I have to say. Mm. So we all know, we kind of all understand children, little children, mm. um, but then eventually these little children have a tendency to grow. They do. And what is the main difference, in your opinion and expertise, um, between a child and an adolescent? Um. Well, one's fun and the other's annoying, <laughs> but that's but a slightly more scientific answer, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, the main changes are biological. So there's a change in the the body shape, the body function, um, and um, the appearance. So children start to change their faces and their bodies, and they start to look like grown-ups, functioning adults. So that's the biological changes. Then there's psychological changes. And the main psychological change is a search for identity. So adolescents are trying to work out who they are and who they want to be and who they want to be with. Um, and so there's that personal identity, sexual identity, gender identity, all of those identities start to coalesce in, in, um, in adolescence. And also the way that an adolescent thinks is different from a child. So children are very concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, they want something and they want it now. Whereas an adolescent can start to think about a bigger picture, the future, um, and that all fits in with them kind of working out their identity and who they want want to be. And the third ch set of changes that makes an adolescent very different from a child is social changes. So the biggest one that everybody is familiar with is that adolescents don't want to be with their mums and dads and 
their family. It's, True. Yeah. Had a, <laughs> Which I'm they, discovering now. <laughs> yeah, they you know disappear into their bedrooms yeah. or they want to go out. Um, there's a move towards their peer groups mm-hmm. being so much more important. They don't really care what you think, but they do care what their friends think. Um, and they also start to make connections with the, I guess, the political... Um, the personal becomes political for the adolescents. They feel stuff, mm. you know, things matter to them. Uh, saving the world. You know, look at all the climate change marches with all those teenagers that were on those those marches and people like Greta Thunberg is a great example. So those though, that sort of biopsychosocial development is the is what's happening during adolescence and, and it's a it's a process. It starts around 10 or 11, mm-hmm. around puberty and then it keeps going and some people like to think oh 16 and we're done sadly not unfortunately your adolescent child will become an adolescent and then an emerging adult so it's not really all it done keeps going it keeps and going, going. <laughs> yeah it keeps going until sort of early 20s so you need a lot of patience and uh, perseverance i just remember an anecdote i was um saying to one of my friends, oh, I feel so guilty because I haven't seen my second son um, in quite a while because they're both teenagers. Mm. And she's like, oh, yeah, because every teenage son wants to hang out with his mother. No, I know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, let me just leave him. He'll come yeah. to me when he needs me. And the funniest bit about it is, <laughs> is that you know what it is to be an adolescent because you yeah, were exactly. one. Yeah, exactly. But I, but I always think it's a bit like childbirth. You know, you kind of like you do it and it's painful, but then you forget about yeah, it, yeah, you know. Yeah. And unlike childbirth, you don't ever have to do adolescence mm. again. When you, once you've done it, you've done yeah, it. That's it. But that's But we all know it, but yeah. we kind of lose touch with it and yeah. we forget about it. And then we get irritated by it. Um, and that's why I do a lot of teaching around adolescence is to try and reconnect people with their adolescent experience yeah, exactly. um, and, and help them kind of understand that if they can reconnect with that, then they can communicate better with an adolescent boy yeah. or girl. It's actually interesting. Um, so the brain finishes developing quite late, mm. mid to late 20s. Yeah which is actually quite shocking. Like You would not believe that. Um, and especially the prefrontal cortex, so just behind our forehead. Mm. Why is this important? Why should maybe children or adolescents know this, and especially why should parents know this? Well, I don't think adolescents care. Okay. <laughs> I don't, to be honest with you, I think they could care less when yeah. their bra- what their brain what their is brain doing. Is um, but I think it's important for us because it gives us an explanatory framework. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a sort of wave of cortical activity from the back of the brain all the way down to the front to this prefrontal cortex. And with now with all of the imaging that we can do and have, we know that whereas we used to think the brain was all done and dusted by 15, 16, it keeps going until the late 20s. So this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex here and here, and its connections down into things like the limbic system, the emotional regulation part of the brain, that bit doesn't finish. Now, why is it important? Well, it's because the, the, the limbic part of the brain and the dopamine searching parts of the brain underpin sensation seeking, um, which, of course, we think of as risk taking, but it's more like exploratory behavior. So adolescents' brains are driving them to look for new experiences, look for new learning opportunities. But because their prefrontal cortex hasn't fully established, that's the kind of... Um, I won't swear because you'll have to bleep me out. Okay. But it's it's the <laughs> my podcast. We can do what we want. <laughs> it's, it's the bit. The frontal cortex is the O yeah. bit of the. It's the bit that says, "Don't do that. Mm-hmm. Don't say that. Take a beat before you do such and such a thing." Yeah. Um, and so that drives this kind of bulletproofness that adolescents have mm-hmm. because their decision making, A, it's quite impulsive because you need your prefrontal cortex to inhibit responses, but it also is not 
controlling the emotional response. So you think to yourself, well, hell, it won't happen to me or I want to, uh, you know, and your dopamine searching systems are going, oh, more dopamine, more dopamine, more <laughs> dopamine. And your prefrontal cortex hasn't really got into place to go, not a good idea, guys. Um, and so, of course, if as, a, if as an adult, we kind of remember that that's what's going on in an adolescent brain, it can help us take a beat. It can help us go, OK, so they're not being difficult. It's just they're, the vic you know, we're the, the victim of our biology in yeah. some ways. Our brain, the, the adolescent brain is wired to behave like an adolescent. It's driving all of until those. Until late 20s, nonetheless. Until the late 20s. Well, that's why... You, that, yeah, well, that's why the insurance, that's why you think, oh, I buy them. A, they pass their licence at yeah. 17 and you want to buy them a car and your insurance is through the roof yeah. because they are impulsive and they make mistakes when they're driving, especially when they've got their friends in the car. So they're more impulsive. So moving back to parents a little bit, mm. I found with my two sons that okay, find their children. And then all of a sudden I thought, actually, I have to deal with them differently now that they're teenagers, um, which I found quite interesting as a mindset. Mm. So would you have any advice for parents how to kind of manage, you know, not treating your child or your teen or adolescent as a child, mm. but actually you have to adapt to the stage that they're in? Yeah, I mean, it, and there's that pro, there's that process by which they kind of like they don't think you really understand what it's like to be an adolescent. As we've already mentioned, we were one, yeah. we were one, but we don't remember it. Yeah. And so when we say to them, "I'd like you home by eleven o'clock," it's I think you're being mean, rather than actually I love you, I care for you, and I want you to be safe. Mm. So the boundaries that we want to put in place are pushed against. Having said that, it's important to have those boundaries in place. You, but it's about negotiating and I was say, yeah, isn't it better to kind of set boundaries with them? Sometimes? Well, yes, and decide what you know what battles you want to yeah. win. You know, you've got to pick your battles. Yeah. But at the same time, I think my certainly my sons have said to me, "You are a good mum." Well, they didn't say that at the time, yeah. but they now, as they're adults, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. thank you both, thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. Now that they're adults and they've got their own kids, they're now in a situation where they're seeing that you do need to have some boundaries. You do need to have some guidelines. So it is challenging. And I think the hardest bit is the bit that you've mentioned, the fact that they don't want to be with you anymore, mm. that they want to be either on the phone to their mates or they want yeah. to be on their tablets or they want to be you on... You think, have I failed? <laughs> yeah, and actually you've succeeded. Yeah, I think that's, that's the true. thing, you've succeeded. Because if they do occasionally come down to be fed and watered, yeah. well, then that's a success because they true. still want to be with you. Mm. But it's on their with you on their terms. Yeah. Um, and it's then important to remember it's only a temporary yeah. period of time. It's the shortest period of time in their in you know yeah, in true. their life yeah, it's not right. very long um because once they get into their 20s if you've done okay mm -hmm. they will want to hang out with yeah, you they, will, come back. they yeah. will and they will come back and they will watch the telly with you and they will <laughs> uh we climbed uh, we climbed snowden a few weeks ago and both of the boys were with us with their kids and they it was really really nice walking and talking with them now as as adults so yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And there's no easy answer. Um, I think patience and um, negotiated um, negotiated lines of battle mm -hmm. uh, is the best way to, okay. to, to, to manage it. As long as it. we're aware, it's hard. We, I think. Yeah, and good. forgiving ourselves. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, not trying to be perfect. Mm. I mean, there is no such thing as a perfect parent of an adolescent. If there is, you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just can't. You've got to you've got to get it wrong sometimes. Yeah. And you've got to demonstrate to them mm -hmm. that you're comfortable getting it wrong. Mm. Um, and admitting it sometimes. If you're wrong, you're wrong, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's the thing. And and roll you know, sort of really sort of modeling, modeling yeah. the behavior that you would like them to see. Because that's another one that is quite funny is that, you know, parents will complain about kids on their phones and yet the parents are on their phones all that's the time. It. Or they'll complain about them drinking. And what do the parents do at the weekend? 
they drink. What's you know what is what's the difference? Mm, you've got to, so you've got to model yeah. model some of the behaviours that you'd like. So if you don't want them on their phones all the time, and you definitely don't want them on the phones at dinner time, mm. well then you shouldn't be on your phone at dinner yeah, time. So you need to negotiate, you know, negotiate those those battle lines. What's yeah. what's acceptable? What's reasonable? And what's your line in the sand? Yeah, I like that. Very sensible, I think. So we have adolescents, mm -hmm. and then you have been extensively working with adolescents with actually chronic illnesses. Yeah. So again, two big topics rolled into one. So tell us more about that, and what are these chronic illnesses that uh, adolescents can have? So illness or medical condition, I think mm -hmm. it's important to say that because some conditions don't think aren't an illness as such mm -hmm. so things like um diabetes is a very good example type 1 diabetes in adolescence particularly with a peak diagnosis in early teens right. um things like arthritis um but you can also have obviously there's things like cancer um any condition like I mean, it could be chronic fatigue or chronic pain. And in fact, adolescents, um, their bodies become much more sensitive to pain and also fatigue because of hormonal changes. Right. So again, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic pain syndrome. So any condition which is either never going to go away, like diabetes, or is going to be around for a long time would be classed as a, a chronic, chronic condition. So... Something like diabetes or arthritis requires medication. Right. And for an adolescent, taking a medication is a challenge. It interferes with their life. Is it also a stigma? Um, it can be. Uh, so young people with diabetes, when they're injecting, for example, people can say, unkind things they can make nasty comments um, and of course stigma comes from ignorance and fear and prejudice and unconscious bias so anything where you are publicly obviously experiencing that condition um, there will be different reactions so with cancer for example people tend to have a oh dear poor thing response um, but with something like diabetes it can be embarrassing for the young person who's maybe having to inject themselves or do a finger prick or something like that or who wears a, a cgm people will be familiar with those little white mm -hmm. discs that a lot of people now wear to measure their blood glucose um, that's another podcast as to whether or not that's appropriate. Okay. If you don't have a condition, <laughs> should you be wearing one? Right. Um, but but kids, you know, so that's with diabetes particularly is is something that can be stigmatizing, and people are scared of it if they don't understand it. So they make silly comments like, "Should you be eating that?" or right. or "Oh, can you catch it?" and and so that so stigma is a thing that then can make the person with the condition feel bad about themselves and if they feel bad about themselves that can make it even harder to manage and if you then think about another layer which is adolescents who are obsessed with how they look yeah. and what they're wearing um, if you add in that to people noticing them they don't want to be noticed but they do want to be noticed but they're then getting noticed for the wrong reasons so it's pretty hard. So if you've got all of these challenges of adolescence and then you have the challenges that managing a chronic condition brings, they clash and each one makes it hard to be successful yeah. at managing the other one. Interesting. Sounds quite, yeah. Mm. It's hard enough having an adolescent versus them having something as well. Yeah, yeah. So maybe just um, to talk a little bit about parents' mindset in this case. Mm. So I had a friend and her daughter was actually at age four diagnosed with cancer. And they told the mother that a lot or to a big extent, her mindset will influence the child's outcome. Mm. So what can we say about the parents, either as a single parent or as a family unit? How does that influence the child and does it? So I think it's really important for people to be clear what is meant by outcome. Okay. So we're not talking about il illness recovery or 
that kind of outcome. And I know there's a lot of stuff around if you have a very positive attitude, that'll improve your chances of, of survival and everything mm. like that. But let's put that just to one side. Okay. So there are other outcomes in illness. We have to think about illness uh, in a more holistic way. It's not just about the physical outcome. And we need parity of esteem for both physical and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. So it is true that there's a lot of research. I was worried when I say it's true because yeah. eh, true is not you a good word. changes as well. Yeah, yeah, it's not. I mean, true is not a good word. Okay. But on average, let's say. On a, well, let's. Is that not good either? Let's, <laughs> let's say that the research supports. Right. Uh, better. Mm -hmm. Um, quality of life and better psychological outcomes if parents are supported and parents have positive mental attitudes and good emotional well-being themselves. Right. Now, much harder for single parents, much, much harder for single parents because of all of the other confounding factors. And that's the, it's very easy in the media just to say, oh, single parents. Mm. But single parents have less income. They have less um, emotional support. They may not have such good living, this living uh, environment. There are so many other things mm. that are confounding factors with being a single parent. And with um, parents where there's, or carers where there's two, mm -hmm. um, Again, the challenges are financial because chronic illness can cause masses of financial demand. Um, it can cause arguments as to how you manage and look after your child. Do you let them away with things because they're not well? Um, and then there's the impact on siblings who feel ignored and can feel jealous and can themselves have an impact on their emotional well-being. So, yes, to some extent, there is some validity in saying if as a carer of a child, single or otherwise, you have a positive mental attitude, that that will help your child have um, a more a positive um, emotional outcome when they have a chronic illness. But it's not a guarantee. Yeah. So I think that's the other thing. You can be as positive yeah. as you like. Your your child or adolescent can still be very very unhappy. So I think it's a bit it's a bit trite and a bit easy to just say, oh, you have to have a positive yeah. mental attitude because you have to think, well, what else do you have to have to have one? Do you yeah, have? That's true. Do you know? Yeah. Have you got food? Yeah, exactly. Have yeah. you got an income? Yeah. Are you able to work? Are you able to pick your kids up from school? Are you able to make all of the hospital appointments? Yeah. And we forget all of this. Um, so I think the other thing is it's so important that we don't just give support to the young people. Mm. We need to remember that they live in a system and that there are brothers and sisters. I think that's interesting, the siblings, parents, which we tend to forget about. Actually. Always, they always get yeah. forgotten. And yeah. so we've got to remember those. And grandparents <laughs> and school friends. Um, everybody, yeah, you know, no true. kid, yeah. no kid is exists yeah. on their own yeah. in a little yeah. circle. They've got a whole system around them. And that system needs to be encouraged and supported to support the young person. Do they get that? Is that easy to come by? Or? It's a bit of a postcode lottery, really. I mean, the child and adolescent mental health services are completely overrun with severe um, mental health concerns and problems. Um, the hospitals themselves now do have more paediatric psychological services, but they're often overrun and have waiting lists. Um, they might just see the the child and not provide support to the family. So like many things at the moment, it's a bit of a postcode lottery. Right, okay. Another thing that we read about in the press often, and I think it's getting more and more popular, is ADHD. Mm. So just walk us quickly through what that is and how does ADHD and adolescence kind of clash together? Mm. So ADHD is chronically underdiagnosed. It's really important to say that. It's also important to be very, very clear that ADHD is a biological neurodevelopmental condition. It's not something that's caused by um, what you eat. It's not something that's caused by chaotic parenting. Mm. It is a biological neurodevelopmental condition where the brain does not develop in a neurotypical way. And what you end up with are three core symptoms. So inattention, 
impulsivity and um, often hyperactivity. Now, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a really rubbish name because people with ADHD don't have a deficit of attention. <laughs> they have too much. They don't, <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. It's the struggle to focus. Yeah. And it's because their prefrontal cortex is not completely wired up the way a neurotypical cortex is fired up. So they have difficulty with key executive functions. So they will have difficulty with metacognition, thinking about thinking. They will have think, difficulty with working memory, that short-term processing uh, uh, capacity that we need to kind of keep on track. They will have difficulty self-monitoring. They will have difficulty being flexible and they and managing change. And they will also be often incredibly impulsive. Um, so, okay, that's ADHD. And what's adolescence? Adolescence is all of that. More of the same. More <laughs> of the same. So it it's often a bit like um, ADHD on top of adolescence mm. makes it much harder to get through adolescence. And of course it makes it hard. And there's also social social challenges for young people with ADHD for lots of different reasons. Mm. Um, but that then can interfere with a young person's ability to make friends. And again, what is it, what's important for an adolescent? Making friends. And if you've got ADHD, that can be a challenge. So it's really important that neurodiversity is recognized. It's really important that there's more education, both for teachers and schools and parents and for the young people themselves so that they understand that the things that they struggle with, first of all, are um, manageable and it can be you can be trained you can be coached so that you can um, and you can also use things like mindfulness to um, improve the connectivity so there's some good research that shows regular mindfulness um, behaviors and mindfulness activities can actually help okay. um, develop those frontal cortex connections so it's not that you can never do it yeah. Although that's somehow it fits, sometimes that's how it feels. But it's not that with ADHD you can never do these things. It's just that it is more difficult for you. But if you can get the right support and the and reasonable adjustments in your schooling and in your workplace and in your family, mm -hmm. then you can do what everybody else does. Okay. Sometimes it's enough that we're aware of it, right? So. Well, self-awareness, yeah. so important. Yeah. yeah, understanding why you might be impulsive yeah. or understanding why you might not be great at managing time or understanding that you get very hyper-focused and yeah. work and forget to go to the loo and forget to have tea. I mean, that's, you know, that's self-care. Yeah. And so you might just need somebody to say, right, because you've got ADHD, it's very hard for you to remember to do these things. I'm going to come knock on the door. Okay. and say, do you need a cup of tea and do you oh, need nice. to go to the loo? There's some very, you know, there are ways of working around it. But again, we don't have anywhere near enough support. Mm -hmm. And getting an ADHD diagnosis, for example, is awful at the moment. Mm -hmm. It can take years. It can t For adults, it can take up to four years on the NHS. And for children, it can take one year, two years, three years. Right. Again, depends Difficult. where you live. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're a clinical psychologist. I am, yes. And also a grandmother. <laughs> Which is sweet. <laughs> Very proud grandma. Oh. So you have an interesting grandson that you're going to tell us something about. Yes. And also what I'm interested in are the two roles. Um, what's the word? Um, like, can you put the two roles together ah. or do you have to keep them separate? Okay. So yes, I have five beautiful grandchildren. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> love them all. Very proud of them, ranging in age from two and a half up to um, 19 in one month's time. Okay. Um, they're all fabulous, um, fun, um, and I love spending time with all of them. Um, but uh, just over a year ago, uh, my grandson, who is 13, uh, was diagnosed with diabetes. Okay. And of course, it felt like a really bad joke of the universe 
given that I had spent 25 oh, yeah. years working in diabetes, writing a book about how to manage teenagers with diabetes, to now have a teenager <laughs> with diabetes. It was not funny. Life, life, hey? yeah. It was really hard. I was yeah. very, very upset. Yeah. And I experienced all of the emotional distress that I had supported people with for years. I had worked with people who had just been told that their son or daughter or grandson or daughter had been diagnosed and I would be the psychologist in the room supporting them and helping them think through that distress. Um, I was lucky. I had lots of friends and uh, some of whom are psychologists. <laughs> um, but I told them to stop being a psychologist and just be yeah. a friend. Um, so I experienced that. And it, there's a big difference between living it Mm. Um, emotionally and knowing it in your heart okay. and knowing it intellectually. And your question, can you be both? Nope. Absolutely not. Wow. I mean, I found that when I had my boy, when my boys were teenagers and I would do my psyche stuff with yeah. them, they would look at me and go, would you stop it? Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they sussed you yeah. out. So I used to do all this really cool stuff, you know, people with headaches, I would help them manage yeah. their migraines. Yeah. And if one of them had, a, I'd say, okay, so we just, and they'd go, go away, <laughs> just go away. And with, so I learned, I learned, but with Z um, Zander, my grandson, I've had to really be careful because I'm so aware I've written papers about yeah. being a teenager and how to be with a teenager. And so I just have to try and follow my advice and not give it. So maybe that's the big difference. Okay. Um, and of course, I said to him when he was diagnosed, oh, you need, would you like to speak to a psychologist? And he looked at me and said, seriously, grandma, what are they going to take it away from me? And I said, well, no, that's a good point. No, I wasn't suggesting that a psychologist was going to make your diabetes better. I said, but, you know, they could help you think about what it's like to have diabetes. And he said, I'll think about it. <laughs> oh, wow. And he's basically done that every time I've said, do you want to see somebody? And he goes, I'll think about it, Graham. That's his way of telling yeah. me to buzz off. Okay. So he is doing really well. I'm very, very proud of him. He hasn't stopped doing anything. He eats chocolate Easter eggs. He climbs Snowden. He does judo. Okay. He's doing his Duke of Edinburgh award. He hasn't let diabetes stop him, but it does make him miserable at times. And he hates it with a vengeance. Mm. And we have had that conversation. Yeah. Um, and... Um, he will become even better at managing it. And he is pretty good at managing it right now. But in answer, no, you can't be a, you can't be a psychologist to your grandson. You just have to let other people do that. Yeah. And you have to just bite your lip, bite your lip. And just be a grandma. And just be a grandma. Oh, yeah. Okay. So saying that, um, you now run your own business. Mm -hmm. You are a transformational coach. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I've kind of combined all my experience as a psychologist mm -hmm. working with adolescents and working with parents and working with people with uh, neurodiversity um, with a coaching uh, practitioner level qualification in coaching, which I've been doing for about three years. Um, and so I, I kind of call it thoaching. Thoaching. <laughs> thoaching. It's a bit of a mix of therapy and coaching. Yeah. It, it means that, so I, I, I work in a very solution focused and motivational interview based way. So very positive, um, a sort of positive psychology approach. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about inviting people to find their own answers. Um, and I work with people within the NHS, um, within the public sector, as well as um, individuals um, with um, ADHD. So I do individual coaching and okay. also group coaching. And I love it. It's really, really nice. Um, work with some emerging adults okay. as well. <laughs> yeah, so I do some work with emerging adults and with parents, helping okay. them think about how to manage their um, their adolescence. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Very so I love doing that. It's great fun. Oh, good. I'm glad you found like a nice purpose as well. Um, so to end this topic of mm. adolescence and psychology, would you have a positive takeaway for our viewers and listeners today? Um, I think I would, I would definitely say that adolescence can be one of the most exciting and fulfilling 
um, times and they can offer you so much because they're growing and you can see them growing. And if you can just be patient, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think the other expression, this too shall pass. Yeah. And, um, and remember that even if they are driving you mad, you are going to want to be their best friend when they're in their early 20s. And if you can just let them know that. And I think being really honest with them and saying, you know what, you're, um, you're driving me insane, but I'm really looking forward to when you're a grown up. Um, and then you get so many dividends. So like I said, um, two fabulous adults bearded <laughs> men um, and uh, as, as five fabulous grandchildren and we're you know very very lucky that they want to spend time with us yeah. so I think we must have done some things okay but I also want to say to the parents don't try and be perfect okay. you can't be perfect you can only be good enough you can only try your best and um, and if you do that and don't beat yourself up and um are patient and compassionate with yourself as being patient and compassionate with your adolescence. There's a great dividend when they, they grow up. That was lovely, Deborah. Thank you so much for today. <laughs> Thank you. I really love talking with you. Really Likewise. enjoyed it, Coco. Thanks, Deborah. Bye.